Hey everyone, welcome to Church of the City New York Online. Thanks for logging in and gathering with us wherever you are, wherever you're coming from. It's such a joy and a gift to get to be with you uh, here on this Sunday. We've had people praying for you in our pre-service prayer hour. Um, Thanks for being a part of that, if you were a part of that. And so we just have great anticipation that God is going to meet us and speak to us. Uh, Psalm 73 says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We're living in challenging times. Emotionally, there's stress on our hearts, there's stress on our bodies. And so this is a chance to just come together and come before God who is the strength of our heart. And so I would just invite you to find a posture of worship, a posture of listening, a posture of receiving uh, as we gather together. Please stand wherever you are as we worship. You can go full screen if you need to in order to minimize distractions. Uh, And let's just worship the Lord together. I have heard the sound coming on the way, changing hearts and minds, healing brokenness. And I hear a generation breaking through despair. I hear a generation.
glorious and he is Jesus and all my hope is in him he is freedom and he is healing right now he is
Keep on getting better, keep on getting better. Keep on getting better, you keep on getting better. Keep on getting better, you keep on getting better. Better and better. Keep on getting better, you keep on getting better. Better and better. Keep on getting better, you keep on. Five one says, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Ooh, you've always been faithful, Lord. God, we proclaim your faithfulness right now in this moment. God, through any situation, we know that you are faithful. You always have been. You always will be, God, so we sing of your goodness, your goodness in the morning, your faithfulness at night, Father. You are good, you are good, you are good. God, and there's still more to see, there's still more of you. Jesus 
Father, as we gather, we just focus our attention on you. We know that it's only by giving you our attention, by putting our eyes on you, that our hearts are able to just be be formed and be shaped and just grow in their sensitivity to you and to your word and to your voice. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for meeting us where we are. Thank you for uh, loving our hearts no matter what they're going through. You are so good to us. We just um, fix our attention on you and we give you our love and our devotion as we uh, hear from your word today. So be with us, Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, everyone, my name is Tyler. I just wanna welcome you. I'm on staff here at Church of the City, New York. It's such a joy to get to be with you. Uh, Our heart is to see disciples of Jesus walking in the way of Jesus, seeking the presence of God, living for the renewal of the city. This is our vision, presence, formation, mission, that you would be shaped as somebody that's a radical disciple of Jesus in our time. It's so much more important now than ever that we have radical disciples in love with Jesus, living lives of renewal. So thanks for being with us. Um, If you wanna know anything about what's going on in the life of our church, you can find it online. Everything is digital now. Uh, We're no different. So go to church.nyc and that's going to be the homepage, our website where you can find everything. Our newsletter, our social media links, our community groups, um, everything going
going on in the life of our church. So take a minute and uh, go there if you haven't had a chance to explore um, what's going on. There's a couple really interesting opportunities coming up in the weeks ahead that I just want to give you a heads up and let you know about. One is, in two Thursdays from now, Pray NYC, our prayer ministry, is going to be hosting an online webinar and discussion event about developing the gift of discernment. And so this is going to be with Dr. Wanda Walborn, who is a good friend of our church, um, and we've uh, heard a lot from her husband, Ron Walborn, as well in the past. And so this is going to be a really awesome time to ask the question, what is the biblical gift of discernment? What does the Bible have to say about it? What does it look like to discover and develop this gift in our own lives? And how do we apply discernment both individually and collectively to the world around us? These are challenging times and uh, the gift of discernment I think is a really critical um, gift to have in our body as a people. So come to that if you're able. You can find all of the event details on pray.nyc. Secondly, you know, we've heard from so many amazing, thoughtful, compelling voices over the past few weeks about race, about Black Lives Matter, about a theology of reconciliation, about crying out for justice. We've heard from David Bailey, from Dr. David Ireland. It's been a really beautiful time of learning in the life of our church, and we want to continue to connect learning with action. And so two Fridays from now, on the 24th at 6 p.m., there's going to be another prayerful protest gathering in Times Square, right in the symbolic heart of our city. And this is with Stop the Silence, a Christian organization committed to prayer, committed to reconciliation, committed to justice. And so we want to join them and just cry out for justice and for a move of God towards renewal and towards setting things right in our city. And so we would just invite you to join us from that. We will be there and we think it's going to be a really beautiful time of uniting in prayer in public for renewal of our city. And so we would just invite you to continue to seek justice and continue to seek God's will that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So join us for that two Fridays from now. As we continue to move into this season, New York is beginning to reopen, but things aren't quite the way that they were. Um, It's a really unique and challenging time. And so we want to be a church that bears one another's burdens and is present in serving one another and helping one another. And so if you need help financially or emotionally, if you need a pastoral conversation or anything like that, I would just encourage you to reach out to us. Reach out to our care team, reach out to our benevolence team, to our financial counseling um, ministry. We've got a lot of resources in place to help you with whatever you're going through. And so we just want to be a church that grows in generosity and grows in that Acts 2 New Testament vision of just sharing with one another and having all things in common, especially in a time of challenge um, when a lot of people are going through hard times. So we say a generosity liturgy every week as a way of just reminding ourselves and reinforcing in our hearts the kind of people that we want to be. The body of Jesus is different than any other type of gathering in the world, and generosity is one of the key markers of that community. So let's read the generosity liturgy out loud together wherever you are. Holy Father, There is nothing I have that you have not given me. All I have and am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus. To spend everything on myself and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world that you cannot abide. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with free hearts and serve him with renewed minds, who withstand the delusion of riches that chokes the word, whose hearts are in your kingdom and not in the systems of the world. I am determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. I'm determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust me with true riches. Above all, I'm determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen. If Church of the City is your home church, no matter where you're from, I would just invite you to give, to give generously. Help us continue to steward this work that God is doing in our midst um, to reach New York and to make disciples in the way of Jesus. You can give online at church.nyc slash give. You can give one time, recurring, whatever it is, but I would just encourage you even more now than usual to give generously. We just uh, want to continue to partner with you and invite you to join us in the work that God is doing in New York City. So take a minute and do that. And then uh, take a minute and um, grab a coffee, whatever you need to do. Maybe say hello to somebody in the chat box, and we'll be back with the teaching text and today's sermon. We give you praise all our days. We give you praise. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. See his wounds, 
his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance seen by heavy stone, Messiah still and all along. Come on, let's sing it together. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Oh, oh Lord our God. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels rose. Hello, church. My name's Alicia. I'm coming to you from Manhattan's Upper East Side. Today's teaching text is Habakkuk 3, verses 16 to 19. It says, I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Hi, my name is Susie Silk and I'm the teaching pastor here at Church of the City. Here at Church of the City, we love quoting Habakkuk 3.2, which says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. But today, as was evident from the teaching text, I want us to focus on the end of chapter three, the conclusion to Habakkuk's prophetic book. Over the past few weeks, we've spent a number of sermons talking about the prayers of intercession, prayers of racial reconciliation, praying for greater authority in the kingdom, and primarily prayers focused on the city at large. But today, I want to acknowledge the fact that many times we find ourselves in a season where we don't have the energy to rejoice or celebrate or even to push the kingdom forward in the same way. Rather, we're in a season of fruitlessness, barrenness, and desolation, a season of life full of pain, of weeping, and of waiting, when it takes all of our strength to get out of bed, to pray, or even to hope for a better future. See, this is exactly the season of life that Habakkuk found himself in and what shapes his prayer. We might not realize this in the opening verses of the chapter. If we read it out of context, we might just feel passionate and energizing. But at the end is where we see his heart, where he's at, this cry in a season of fruitlessness and desperation. Now, there's three parts to this final prayer from Habakkuk, the cry, the choice, and the conclusion. But before we dive into these three parts in this prayer, we need to understand the context of what's happening to Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk was a prophet in the southern kingdom living from, who was speaking from around the time of 605 BCE to 587 BCE when finally Jerusalem is going to fall. The northern kingdom has already fallen, but the southern kingdom is still standing. And yet the southern kingdom is full of injustice. The society as a whole is broken. And this is why Habakkuk begins his book by crying out to the Lord, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? So Habakkuk is frustrated with the state 
of his society. Meanwhile, Babylon, under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, is growing as a world power and threatening the remaining southern kingdom. Now, in response to Habakkuk's cry about national injustice, God tells Habakkuk that he's going to have the Babylonians, a group of people who have built their empire on violence and exploitation, invade Judah as God's punishment for her sin and idolatry. Well, at this point, Habakkuk's even more upset, right? How is it possible that God is going to send the unjust Babylonians to somehow bring justice on the injustices of Judah? And how is Habakkuk going to survive the slaughter? How will the nation survive this inevitable slaughter? God responds by telling Habakkuk that the righteous shall live by faith, to trust that God will in fact bring justice upon the Babylonians in the future. So then Habakkuk begins to pronounce woes upon Babylon to say that eventually God will punish them. And finally, we get to chapter three. Here, In agony and in desperation, Habakkuk composes a prayer, a song of lament and of faith. He says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Essentially, God, renew your people. In the wrath that you're about to send through the Babylonians, remember mercy by rescuing your people as you have in the past. God responds to this cry with a theophany. God gives the prophet Habakkuk a vision of God as the warrior God who will eventually avenge his chosen people and thresh the nations. Their God will ride out in victory against the Babylonians. The Babylonians who have brought destruction on Judah will eventually be punished by God himself. And this is good news for Habakkuk. But the reality is, is that Habakkuk is still stuck in the present he still is going to have to live through the invasion of the Babylonians. And so we finally, when we finally make it to these last few verses of this chapter in the book, the prophet is wrestling with how do I live in the present? How to live in the midst of a society that's turned away from God? How to deal with the fact that the land itself is now desolate and broken because it's not receiving the blessings of rain from God? and how to deal with the fact that he's seeing the enemies begin to assemble on Judah's borders, ready to invade Jerusalem. Habakkuk has a future promise of salvation, a future promise of restoration and deliverance, but he's not gonna get to see that until he's lived through the Babylonian invasion. And in fact, we actually don't know if he does live long enough to see God's judgment against Babylon. So Habakkuk knows that God will renew his good deeds in the future, but he still has to live through the present desolation and destruction. So this is the question. How does Habakkuk pray in the midst of this? How does he pray in the midst of a season of fruitlessness, of barrenness, of destruction, of despair? What does his prayer life look like? Well, this leads us into the first part of Habakkuk's prayer. And this is that he cries out to God. Habakkuk begins by acknowledging the world that he lives in. He doesn't pretend or scramble to fix things or think that somehow he can get around the situation. Instead, he cries out to God with raw emotions in response to the world that he's living in and the pain he's experiencing. We see this in verse 16. He talks about his heart pounding, his lips quivering, decay entering his bones and his legs trembling. And then in verse 17, he says, the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines. The olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. There are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. This is a season of fruitlessness. The fields are barren and there's nothing Habakkuk can do about it. He can't fill the clouds with rain, nor can he convince the people to turn back from their wicked ways, which are causing all of this. Now, the theme of fruitlessness or barrenness is actually found throughout the scriptures. Unless we assume that difficult or fruitless seasons are always the result of sin or not trying hard enough, we read of many prophets and many righteous followers of God who face seasons of fruitlessness and barrenness in their life. And then we read of how they cried out in desperation. Here's a couple examples. Joel prophesies about the locusts 
uh, descending upon the nation, both literal locusts who are going to destroy the crops and sort of figurative locusts, the locusts of foreign armies who are going to also destroy the fields and the people. And so Joel turns to God and prays, I cry out to you, Lord, because the pastures and trees are dried up as though a fire had burned them. Even the wild animals cry out to you because the streams have become dry. Elijah, who we remember for his heroic acts on Mount Carmel, who, as James describes, is a righteous man whose prayer was powerful and effective. Well, Elijah also faces this season in life. He cries out first to the Lord to actually withhold rain from the people, to cause a drought to happen so that maybe the people will turn back to God. And then later he asks God for rain and God sends rain. And yet Elijah is exhausted from this extended season. And so even after seeing God move in power and bring rain, Elijah cries out in desperation, it's too much, Lord, take away my life. Job, Job watches the destruction of his crops, the death of his servants, and finally the death of his children. And he's sitting in mourning and despair, wishing for death, but at the same time refusing to curse God in order to die, but actually instead cursing the day he was born. Job is an entire book dedicated to a righteous man's grief and prayers to God in the midst of fruitlessness, barrenness, and utter destruction. And yet Job was described by God as a righteous, faithful man. The book of Ruth likewise has a female character who has lost everything. Her name's Naomi, and she's been forced out of her country due to famine. She watches her first husband, first her husband die, and then both of her sons die. And so she changes her name from Naomi, meaning pleasant one, to Mara, meaning bitter one. She returns to Israel and hopes that the Lord will somehow provide for her, even in this season of deep loss and desperation. And of course, not only do we have stories of fruitlessness, but we have the literal theme of barren men and women running throughout the Bible. And again, lest we attribute barrenness to sin, we have the examples of Sarah, Isaac, and Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Samson's mother, Hannah, and Zachariah, and Elizabeth. Men and women who walked faithfully with God for many years and yet faced countless years of barrenness when there was no fruit from their womb. But like Habakkuk crying out about the lack of fruit on the vine, these men and women, they cried out about the lack of fruit of their womb. We read of Isaac praying for his wife, Rebecca, in Genesis 25, 21. Because Rebecca had no children, Isaac prayed to the Lord for her. The Lord answered his prayer, and Rebecca became pregnant. Now, when we read this verse, it feels like Isaac offered a single prayer. God immediately responded. But if the math is correct between verse 20 and verse 26, then Isaac and Rebecca were married for 20 years between the first half of this verse and the second. 20 years of barrenness and fruitlessness, yet living in the promise that God will make a great nation through Isaac. Luke 1 opens by telling us of Zechariah and Elizabeth, describing them both as righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. These two had experienced years of fruitlessness and yet had remained obedient and faithful. And we know that they prayed for children because this is how Gabriel begins his speech to Zechariah, that the Lord has heard their prayer. They had been faithful people of prayer despite decades of unanswered prayer. In 1 Samuel 1, we get a glimpse into the prayer life of Hannah, one of the Bible's most famous barren women, because we actually get to read her prayer ourselves. 1 Samuel 1 reads, In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. It's that word Mara again. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Notice the word repetitions in her prayer, the same things that we see in Job and the prophets, anguish, weeping, grief, trouble, bitterness, and pouring out soul. Now, I want you to see a few things in all of these stories. We're told Elijah was a man just like us. 
and that he was a righteous man. At the time of Job, God said that there was no one on earth as faithful and good as Job was. Elizabeth and Zechariah were told that they lived good lives in God's sight and obeyed him fully. So we need to see that just like the man who was born blind, that Jesus said his blindness was not a result of sin, there are going to be times in our life when we face extended seasons of fruitlessness, barrenness, and destruction that are not a result of our own sin. Seasons of spiritual warfare, seasons of sickness, seasons of grief and loss and death, seasons of waiting and longing, seasons when we seem to move forward slowly and painfully. And yet, like Habakkuk, we're sometimes forced to live through them. There's no way to get around this season, no way to get out of it. We can only go through it. And I know that's not the uplifting words that you want from a charismatic pastor today. You want to say that we can get victory immediately if we pray with enough faith. But the Bible doesn't actually tell us that. So instead of minimizing or denying these seasons of life, we must instead choose to learn what prayer and obedience looks like in a season of fruitlessness. When the promises of God seem to tarry, or be met for another generation. When we know this season might not end anytime soon. So the first thing that we learn from Habakkuk is to cry out, to bring the reality of our situation before the Lord in prayer, in weeping, in pain, in frustration, in bitterness and sorrow. Well then what? How do we respond when the world is bleak, barren and desolate? This leads us into part two of his prayer, the choice. But in order to understand Habakkuk's choice, we need to see that our choice, our response, is always connected to God's response to our prayer. Earlier in chapter three, we're told that Habakkuk cries out in verse two, and then he has a vision and it says, God came from Temna. God came. The scriptures tell us that God hears the cries of the oppressed. Psalm 69, 33, the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. We're told that he's near the contrite and the lowly. Isaiah 57, 15, for this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. This is who God is. He's near the contrite and lowly. He hears the cries of his people. And so we see a link between verse 3, God came, and the beginning of Habakkuk's prayer in verse 16, I will wait. Because see, there's a relationship between waiting and God's coming and yet the order seems to go in all different ways. There's a pattern in the scriptures of theophany and prophetic word in each of the stories that we've just talked about. God eventually comes to the person who's crying out in need, who's in a place of desperation and fruitlessness. Habakkuk has a vision of God, the warrior storm God, and yet he still has to wait for the promises of God to be fulfilled. Hannah cries out and eventually receives a prophetic word from Eli that she'll have a son. Job waits and waits and waits and eventually receives a dramatic speech from God out of a storm. Elijah will meet God on Mount Sinai. After he asks God to end his life, God will appear to him and speak to him in the whisper at the end of a storm. Zechariah of Zechariah and Elizabeth, he receives a message from the angel Gabriel that after decades of waiting that God has heard their prayer. And Abraham and Sarah are visited by the three strangers, the angels and God. See, what we need to see is that God eventually always comes and reveals himself to those who wait. But the order of events can vary. Sometimes, like with Habakkuk, the prophet cries out, God comes, but then the prophet has to wait for the fulfillment of God's promises. In other case, like Abraham, the story begins by God coming, by God giving him a promise, and then Abraham has to wait years until finally his son is born. Or with Hannah or Zechariah and Elizabeth, there are years of prayer with no response from God, and then suddenly God speaks and answers their prayers all at once. So maybe you're like one of these people 
and you're wondering, why hasn't God come? Or maybe God has come in the past and he's not fulfilled his promises yet. That's okay. In these stories, we see all different kinds of orders. Maybe you heard a word from God years ago that lets you step forward in faith and you're still waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. Maybe you've been praying for years without a promise, without a word from the Lord, and then suddenly in the future, he will come and answer. Or maybe like Habakkuk, it's been an ongoing dialogue. You cry out, God answers part of your question, it's a frustrating answer, and then you have to wait longer for God to appear again. What I want you to see is there's no formula in the Bible But there is a promise. God eventually always does come and speak. He eventually always fulfills his promises. This is what Naomi or Mara says in the book of Ruth. The Lord keeps his promises to the living and the dead. God eventually comes. It's like the song that we sing in worship, the the Lazarus song. Then you came and I knew that you would come. And this is what is behind Habakkuk's prayer. The realization that God has come and he will come again and fulfill his promises. And this is what leads Habakkuk into that second part of his prayer, the choice that he makes, his response, the but I, the I will look with eyes of faith. Now, we don't always see this in the English because it seems like it goes right into, but I will rejoice in the Lord. But there's actually a repeated word here, this word ani, myself, I myself, right? So what What Habakkuk is saying is, but I, I myself, I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. It's like when Joshua says, but as for me and my household, there's a repeatedness here because there's a conscious pause and a choice that Habakkuk is making. He's choosing to keep going to God, to believe that God will fulfill his promises, that God hears the cry of the brokenhearted, that God will come again. It's like what Psalm 46, one to three says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. They don't say we won't fear because God's not going to let any of this stuff happen, but no, because God is an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, they won't fear as the earth is giving way. So Habakkuk is doing the same thing. He's saying, I'm going to put my eyes on the Lord, have eyes of faith, and I'm going to make a choice here. And what does he choose to do? He chooses to rejoice. Why can he rejoice? Why in the midst of destruction and fruitlessness and barrenness and sorrow can Habakkuk choose to rejoice? Well, he rejoices because God hears the prayers of his people. And he knows this even when he's waiting for a response from God. It's like what Job says, Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself, there's that that repetition again, I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, another, how my heart yearns within me. Job can say, though he slay me, I know that he keeps his promises to the living and the dead. I know that he hears the cries of his people. So Habakkuk rejoices because God hears his people. And we also see that Habakkuk rejoices because God is who he is. It's interesting, Habakkuk uses two names for God in this short verse. He uses the holy name, this the name Yahweh, the God who is the great I am. And he uses the name Elohim Yeshua, the God of my salvation. And that's important because the first name represents God's unchanging character and the next, his saving nature. And that's why Habakkuk can rejoice because God is unchanging and because God eventually saves his people. So Habakkuk is living out what God had told him earlier, that the righteous shall live by faith. Hebrews 11 says the same thing. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. These men and women of the past who had come before the time of Jesus, they had believed, they had seen with eyes of faith, they had chosen to believe that God would keep his promises, even if they weren't going to see them in their lifetime because they knew that God keeps his promises to the living and the dead, that he would fulfill it in the future for them. Now, living by faith this way is not easy. 
choosing to rejoice in the midst of sorrow, choosing to to look at our circumstances and then put our eyes back on God and say that we, we will trust him is difficult. It's what Eugene Peterson says, a long obedience in the same direction. It's what Ephesians 6, 13 is getting at when it says, after you've done everything to stand. Because it's often a daily decision to get back up after getting beaten down and to say again, but I, I will rejoice in the Lord but I, I will trust in God, but I, I will believe over years and decades of my life. So what does this look like on a daily basis in New York? Well, sometimes this looks like getting out of bed in the morning and making the choice like Job that you're not gonna take your life or curse God. They're gonna say, Lord, I trust you for today, even though I'm in so much pain. Sometimes it looks like opening your Bible and just crying as you read through the words. Sometimes it means raising your hands in worship after the death of a family member, choosing to rejoice. Sometimes it's giving your widow's might, the last of your money, your energy, your love, when you have nothing left out of obedience to God because he's called you to. And I give these examples because I've seen you do this over the last couple of years. I've seen many of you come into worship on a Sunday and worship God after deep and profound loss. I've watched you hold on to the promises of God over many years, not knowing when God will fulfill that promise. I've watched you give the last of your energy just out of obedience when you have nothing left but just because God tells you to love your neighbor. Friends, this is a long obedience in the same direction. This is a standing up after you've been beat down. But God says that the righteous will live by faith. This is the choice that God prompts us into, that Habakkuk tells us to make, that I will not let my circumstances dictate my faith, but I I will trust in God. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. I, I will stand up yet again. And this leads us into the third part of Habakkuk's prayer. We have his cry, we have his choice, and then we have the conclusion. Now, so often we think that a prayer ends by saying, okay, so now I need to strengthen myself. I've chosen this, I've got to do it myself. I've got to have a strategy. It's as if we think the conclusion of our prayer is ours to play. It's ours to say, it's our job to fix and to strategize and to work harder. But it's not. The wonderful part about the end of Habakkuk's prayer is that it shows us that the end of every prayer of desperation is actually God's response. It's the Lord who comes in with his strength versus our strength. And this is the good news. We cry out, we make a choice. God responds to the cries of his people. In verse 19a, we're told that God strengthens Habakkuk. The Lord is my strength. It's not our strength, but God's strength. Likewise, in 2 Samuel 22, David says, it is God who arms me with strength. Ephesians 3, 16 to 17, Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. We trust God and know his love, Paul's saying, because God first strengthens us with power to be able to know his love. This is not, I cry out, I conclude, I strengthen myself and do the best I can. This is, I cry out, I make a choice, God strengthens me, he steps in, he enables me to continue to go. That's why the next thing that verse 19 says is that God transforms us. Habakkuk says, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer, that God changes and equips the prophet. He gives him the ability, he changes his feet. Now, I did a bunch of research this week, and I'll include a link to the video so you can watch it afterwards. But this this word, the deer, the hind, is actually referring to the Nubian ibex of Northeast Africa and the Middle East. And these are mountain goats, mountain deers that can climb precarious mountains. They often, at least in Israel, lived in the Negev, so right where Habakkuk's living in the southern part of Israel. 
but yet because of the way that their feet are made, they can scale near vertical cliffs. Now, why can they do that? Well, their feet are made in such a way that as they spread out, they distribute the weight of the deer across the feet. And as the, the, the paw opens up, it reveals a rubbery, um, sort of like flat rubbery tread that grips the rocks. And what it lets the Ibex do is to leap fearlessly, even at a week old. You can, again, you can watch these videos, but a week old Ibex can scale up and down a sheer vertical cliff because of the way that their feet are. Now, did the Ibex make its own feet? No. Does the Ibex have a strategy to learn how to use their feet over time so they can scale mountains? No, at a week old, because of the way that God has made their feet, they can scale a vertical cliff. And this is what Habakkuk is getting at as he says, he makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. That word here in the Hebrew, it's a causative verb. It's not, oh, he lets me, he, he's okay with it. No, it's he causes me to tread on the heights. This is the work that God does through his spirit. He transforms Habakkuk. He gives him feet like the, Ibian, like the Nubian Ibex, and he causes him to tread on the heights. Now, what about these high places that he's talking to? Now, I want you to understand that what Habakkuk is saying is that God isn't going to remove these obstacles. God isn't going to remove the mountains of the Babylonian invasion, of the fruitlessness that Habakkuk is facing, but he's going to empower Habakkuk to scale these mountains. Oftentimes in life, we think, I can't get through this. There's no, there's no way, God. You gotta take it away. It's the only way I'm gonna get through this obstacle, this pain, this situation in life. And although there are times that God does just remove things, right? Jesus said to his disciples, if you have faith, you can save this mountain, be thrown into the sea. There are times that God does that. But there are also many times in life when God does not remove the obstacle. He does not remove the pain. He doesn't take away the mountain, but he changes your feet so you can scale the mountain. Now, why? Why wouldn't God just remove it? Why not just take Habakkuk and let him move to another country? Why not just get rid of the Babylonians? Why not just brainwash everyone so that there's justice in the world? Well, this is where I want us to lean in a little bit more to this word for high places. He lets me tread on these high places because there's a deliberate choice that is being made in the Hebrew. It's the word bima. Instead of using the word mountain, it's this word that has sort of three different aspects to it. And the word um, bima in Hebrew, it can be, it has a military meaning, a worship meaning, and then the meaning for hinds, for these deers. So the military meaning is that a bima is a, it's like higher ground. It's a strategic location against an enemy, right? So if a person's in battle, they want to gain the bima. They want to gain the higher ground. Also, a high place was often associated with worship in ancient Israel, because in the ancient Near East, they thought about going up into the mountains as being closer to God's presence. And we see this in the story of, of Israel, God speaking on Mount Sinai, God speaking on Mount Carmel, God speaking on Mount Zion. So often, the people would build altars on top of the bimas, on the higher grounds, because they were closer to the heavens. And finally, the bima, the higher grounds, was a place for the the hinds, these deers, these ibexes, to have their homes. Because of the way that their feet are made, they could scale near vertical cliffs, but none of their predators could. So the higher ground, these, these high places, the bima was a place where the ibex could feed and could birth young in safety, without fear of predators, without a fox getting nearby. So this was the three aspects of the higher ground. And the reality check that we sometimes need to realize is that we live in a harsh world full of pain, of brokenness, and enemies. And most of the time, we can't have a response of avoidance or removal. Our response in prayer can't always only be, God, if you don't take this away, there's nothing else I can do. Because many times the Lord is going to tell us instead that we're going to have to walk through it that the only way through this pain, this death, this darkness, is to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's to face the battle. It's to live through the Babylonian invasion, and yet to rejoice even while we are trembling in fear. 
And because so often we have to go through seasons of fruitlessness, destruction, pain, and sorrow, that's why I've chosen this prayer today. Because the concluding words of Habakkuk are actually such a good promise for us to cling to in the midst of these seasons. Because the concluding words of Habakkuk show us that God wants to give us the high places. He wants to give us that that place of strategic military victory against the enemy. David's saying, it is God who arms my strength, arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He causes me to stand in the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. In the midst of pain, in the midst of a devastating season, God will train us for battle. God will help us to stand on the higher ground, on the heights. And you and I, we know this from experience. We know this, that once we gain ground in the certain areas of our life, once we overcome that fear, survive that pain, see God strengthen us in the midst of darkness, that it's much harder for the enemy to threaten us in that area of life. It's much harder for for him to gain ground because we've actually overcome that fear already. We've survived it. With this mountain, this, this obstacle has become a place where we've said, the Lord helped me there. It's an Ebenezer for me. And so when the enemy comes against us, we point to that higher ground and we say, Satan, you have no authority here. God's already given me victory there. I've already seen God meet me in the midst of the worst pain and devastation of my life. So you can't make me afraid here. God has given me the higher ground. So it's actually good news for us when God makes our feet like the deer and when he enables us to tread on the heights. It's also good news that God gives us the higher ground because remember, the bima, the higher places are a place of intimate worship with the Lord. And isn't that true? Isn't that so often true in our life that the darkest seasons, the hardest seasons of our life are also the places where in the midst of the crucible, we experience the nearness of God where we recognize that he is near the contrite and lowly in heart. Maybe not at first. Maybe in the beginning it's devastating and God feels so far away and distant. But as he transforms us, as he changes us, as we scale the mountain, as we press through, well, then we start seeing him answer those prayers. Money shows up at our door to pay a bill. A friend calls us at just the right moment. We open the scriptures and our eyes are drawn to that verse that we needed for that day. We find that actually our hearts are crying out to God in constant prayer in a way that we didn't in a season of abundance. Because in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, God's rod and his staff have brought us comfort. And so it's good news for us when God gives us these places of higher ground, these places of theophany, these places where the voice of God is heard clearly and we receive visions of prophetic words and answers to prayer. And isn't it true that so often we look back on that season and we think, wow, that was so painful and God met me there. That memory becomes an Ebenezer, becomes an altar of God's presence It becomes an area of a life where we're drawn back to God in worship because he gave us that higher ground. And finally, it's good news that God enables us to tread on the higher ground because that is the home for Heinz. And you and I, when we're forced to walk through seasons of fruitlessness, God transforms us. God gives us his strength to know his love and his power And this suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And this hope does not disappoint. Because why? Because he transforms us. He makes our feet like the hinds. We begin to learn how to leap fearlessly through life, to flee from enemy and trouble quickly and swiftly because our feet know the path, because we know the promises of God, because we've won them in a hard season of life. But God has changed us and he lets us leap with joy and freedom in a way we wouldn't have if we had never gone through it and he hadn't transformed us. And friends, that's what we want. We want to be people who are free and fearless and who have the higher ground and who can feed and give birth and be fruitful in safety. Who can say the enemy has no place here. 
I worship in this place because God has strengthened and transformed me. We go from the pit to the wide open plain, from the valley of the shadow of death to a table before, prepared before us in the presence of our enemy, our head anointed with oil, our cup overflowing. And it's not because God took the mountain away. It's because he made our feet like hinds feet, enabling us to tread on the heights. And this is what God does in response to his people. The conclusion of this prayer is not ours, it's his. He strengthens us. He transforms us. He enables us to tread on the high places. This is what he does when we cry out to him. So as we close today, I just want us to remember that when we go through a season of fruitlessness and barrenness and desperation, that the prayer is actually quite simple. Just cry out to him. Tell him exactly what's wrong. You can be brutally honest. You can pour out your heart before God. It's okay if you look drunk like Hannah. It's okay if you're desperate like Job. And in the middle of that, remember that God comes for his people. And it's my prayer that you'll make that choice, that you'll say, the world is broken and hard, and this is terrible, but I, I will rejoice. But I, I will live by faith. I will set my eyes on God. I will stand. I will be obedient. And I want you to rest in the fact that God responds to that. That God strengthens us. That even when we don't realize it's happening, that he changes and transforms us. That his mercies are new every morning. That he enables us to tread on the high grounds. So let me pray these words of scripture over you right now. From Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And then you'd have power to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Yes, Lord, strengthen your people. Enable them even today to grasp your love to recognize your goodness. And Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are walking through hard, exhausting, devastating seasons right now, Lord, who are sometimes clinging to your general promises, sometimes to specific promises, God. Lord, will you conclude their prayer for them? Would you make their feet like the feet of a deer, causing them to tread on the high places. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes, God is faithful. So this is a moment now to respond. This is your one chance, you know, in your week. I don't know what you're, what's going on in your week. I don't know what you have tomorrow or later today or whatever, but this is a chance to press in to what God is doing and to what the Holy Spirit is saying in your life. I know that so many people are going through anxiety. Um, they're on the edge of depression. They're having mental challenges. They're having financial challenges. This is a tough time for all of us. And so we want to be a people of prayer that press in and let God meet us uh, in our deepest place of need, which is our heart. And so uh, we have prayer counselors ready to pray with you. We have a time of lingering where you can log on to a prayer room and a trained person will pray with you. They will listen to you. They will agree um, with God on your behalf. And uh, we would just encourage you to take advantage of that. Don't just close the laptop or turn off the TV and walk away if you still have something unprocessed in your heart. This is a moment where God wants to speak to you wherever you are, and he wants to meet you. So let's respond in prayer and take a few minutes to just um, seal what God has been saying to us. No. Oh.
I will believe it Cause you made mountains move You made giants fall You used songs of praise To shake prison walls I will speak to my fear And I will preach to my Thanks for joining us today, church. May the Lord bless you and keep you wherever you are as you go with the Holy Spirit this week. We look forward to seeing you as you press into prayer in the prayer room or as you press into equipping in our various groups and courses. Let's continue to just press in with one another to follow Jesus this week.
Spirit. 